It's time we settle this. Are using all these new fancy digital fabrication tools like 3D printers, CNC's, and laser cutters actually faster than building things by hand? And the answer is obviously it depends. But how about we test it on a real life shop organization project? I'm slowly but surely setting up the shop space in my new building. You can see I've got the rack set up and this temporary workbench so that I can at least get started working on product development. Now I wouldn't classify any of this as shop greatness. There's still plenty of work left to do in here. But one of the first things I think I wanna do is build a tool wall right here. Now, I'm not normally a French cleat tool wall type of guy because in my opinion, I just think it leads to your tools getting covered in dirt and dust. And I much prefer the clean look with everything put away. But that's just my opinion. It turns out though, in this space, since it's not a traditional wood shop, I don't create a lot of dust. And I always find myself reaching for hand tools for taking saws apart for product development and testing. So having all that right here in plain sight would actually be kind of useful. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm gonna build a French cleat tool wall with custom holders for all the tools that I want easy access to. And this I think is a perfect project for our test. All right, so here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna build the tool wall and the holders twice. Well, really just the tool holders twice because the wall's the same either way. First, I'm gonna design, program, and use the digital fabrication tools to make the tool holders themselves. I'll be careful to keep an accurate amount of time that's physically required by me throughout the entire process. Then, once that's done, I'll remake all the holders using traditional methods. And I don't mean like whittling them out of a block of wood, just using tools that you would have in a standard garage workshop. And then at the end, we'll compare the times and the results to see what wins in this case. Are these expensive machines really worth it for one-off projects, or should you save your money and stick with traditional tools? I think it's an interesting question, but first, we gotta build that tool wall. So first, I'm gonna create the base tool wall out of some plywood. Yes, I suppose I could program this part on large CNC and include it in the comparison, but A, I don't have one of those, and B, I don't think it's a very realistic application. So the time I put into this part of the build will be ignored since it would be identical for both scenarios that we're testing. And I don't want this wall weighing 5,000 pounds and it's not gonna hold very heavy tools, so I opted for half inch plywood construction here for both the back panel and the cleats. And for those cleats, I first ripped them into about two and a half inch wide strips and then cut a 45 degree bevel on one side. And just one quick tip, if you're cutting cleats, having a feather board here makes it much safer and easier. I'm a big fan of these magnetic ones. I'll have those linked down below. And one last little tip here, go ahead and knock down the sharp edges of all your cleats prior to assembly. It just helps everything fit together better later. And now on to that assembly of the tool wall, and I'm just using a lot of glue and brad nails along each cleat. And when it comes to spacing the cleats, I don't think there's anything real scientific here. I just used a couple of spacer blocks so that my spacing was identical all the way up the wall. And if you've watched this channel before, you know about the term shop greatness. I could of course just build a boring standard tool wall and call it good. But instead, I'm gonna take that little extra step to make it awesome. I'm gonna frame out all the edges and build this little valence up top, which is actually gonna hold a light. These little incremental details make such a big difference later and make your shop that much more enjoyable to work in. And though it did look great, it kind of still felt a little unfinished. So I went ahead and applied a couple coats of flat black paint. Again, details. And for the cost of a couple cans of spray paint, I think this makes a huge difference. Now I can go ahead and get this mounted. Now the commercial building I'm in has metal studs, which are kind of a nightmare to tie into. So I got these toggle wall anchors that can supposedly support about 280 pounds of pop. And since I'm using four of them, that gives me what? Over a thousand pounds of capacity. I'm thinking max this thing is gonna be about 200 pounds once it's loaded up, so I should be good to go. So here we go. Got the tool wall mounted in place. It already looks great. And I think the light just adds that little extra detail. Now onto the tool holders. The term digital fabrication covers a broad range of tools that use digital design or input from a computer. This usually involves at minimum a design, whether it be 2D or 3D, and potentially a file that the machine can read. In some cases, that file can be generated at the machine itself, like on some laser cutters, but for the most part, it's usually done on a computer. Now for these tool holders, I'm gonna utilize two different types of digital fabrication, a laser cutter and a 3D printer. I'll use 3D printing to create the cleats and some of the features that hold some of the tools, and the laser cutter to cut out some wood and acrylic elements. At least that's my plan. I could find other uses for them throughout the project. We'll have to see. But before I do anything, I've gotta take a look at the tools. And for that, let's head back out to the shop. All right, I've laid out all the tools that I wanna make holders for. You can see I've got a large variety of hand tools, measuring tools, layout tools, things like that. Now the beauty of a cleat tool wall like this is that you can change it whenever you want. Simply make a new tool holder or move things around to fit your needs. But before I make any holders, I need to arrange the tools, take some measurements, and just kind of figure out how the holders are going to look. And this process is identical, whether you're doing it with digital tools or traditional. So whatever time I take doing this, I'm gonna leave out of the comparison. All right, I've got my notes and my sketches. Now I can get to actually designing. For the 3D printed parts, I need to create the parts in 
3D. Go figure. But for the laser cut parts, I just need to create a 2D vector file. I use the sketch and measurements we took earlier to create those drawings and export them into the right format. From there, I can create the file that I can send to the laser cutter and just hit start. Okay, those designs are now done. And for that entire process, it took me about three hours. That includes the 3D time as well as doing all the vector files for the laser cutter. Now I just need to upload them into the machines and get them started. For the 3D printed files, I first need to slice them and then shoot them off to the printers, in this case via a Wi-Fi connection, but I'm also going to load filament into them to account for that time as well. For the laser cut parts, I just need to import the vector files into the native software, set the parameters for the cut, power, and speed, and then just hit go. Now I'll be generous and say that those additional steps add about 30 minutes of my time. So for the digital fabrication side, we're now at three and a half hours. I'm now free to do something else in parallel while these machines are cranking out parts assuming nothing goes wrong. And this is where the true beauty of leverage comes from when talking about digital fabrication tools. But do you know what else I could do at that time? I can enjoy a nice delicious and nutritious meal for Factor, which conveniently is a sponsor of today's video. Look, if you wanna talk about leveraging your time, Factor is a great way to do that. Factor helps you meet your nutrition goals by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. And as you may know already, I've been a long time paying customer of Factor, so I really believe in what they do. Here's how it works. You pick how many meals you want per week, and then either select a dietary type like keto, vegan, calorie smart, or protein plus, or just mix and match as you like. Each week you can choose from over 30 different chef prepared options, which means you will not get bored. I mean, I'm still finding new ones I haven't even tried yet. Plus there's add-ons like breakfast, smoothies, and juices to fit the gaps in your day. Then your meals show up packed in an insulated box ready for the fridge. And when you're ready to eat, simply pop them in the microwave for two minutes and you're done. And one of the main reasons I use Factor is because it beats the heck out of takeout. It's not only cheaper, but it's also a heck of a lot faster, letting you get back to those summertime activities. And don't worry, I know summer's busy for everyone. You can easily skip weeks if you're gonna be out of town or just have other plans. Look, personally, I love the flexibility of Factor and how they help me stick to my nutrition goals. And the food, honestly, is legitimately good. If you wanna learn more, head to factor75.com or use the link in the description and use code SHOPNATION50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's factor75.com or click the link and enter code SHOPNATION50 to get 50% off your first factor box. Seriously, if you're curious, give them a try. But now, back to the video. So the next day, I got everything kicked off starting with the 3D printed parts. Once that was going, I let the robots do their thing and headed over to the laser cutter. So I know I kind of said that you can do other things in parallel, which for 3D printing, that's absolutely true. But in the case of the laser cutter, which is blasting a hot laser beam through very flammable wood, it's actually not the best idea to walk away while it's working, just in case you need to, well, put out a fire or something. But it still doesn't require that you actually do anything other than be attentive, so you can still do other things, like check YouTube for videos on the latest and greatest five tools you can't live without, or enjoy some tasty ice cream. It's really up to you. At any rate, I need to include this time in our comparison to be fair, and it took about an hour of my time to reload material, start new jobs, and remove the old parts. After the laser robot had its way with about a half sheet of quarter inch plywood and acrylic, it was time for assembly. I designed everything to be glued together with tenons and box joints, so it was just a matter of getting all of the parts situated. And instead of using every clamp I own here, I added some CA glue to help keep things together until the wood glue dried. And for the most part, everything went together really nicely. For what originally looked like a mountain of parts, this went surprisingly fast and only took me about 45 minutes to get everything done just in time to get the 3D printed parts off the printers. Here is a slightly ridiculous example of what digital fabrication can easily allow you to do. I wanted to design a sort of locking cleat that wouldn't come off when you lifted it up. So I added a spring-loaded foot to the bottom that applies pressure to the bottom of the cleat it's resting on and can swivel out of the way for easy removal. Remember, complexity is almost free with digital fabrication. So adding features like this adds a negligible amount of time to the print. And I decided to put these in use to make a completely over the top bit storage system with some laser cut clear acrylic. I mean, this thing looks pretty rad and I've already got four or five other ideas floating around my head of other things I can do. Okay, I went ahead and put up the tool holders on the wall and man, I've gotta say, I really like it so far. There's definitely some upfront time needed for the design, but once you get a system in place, you can crank these out pretty quick. Like there's a couple of these that are just clones of another one with a different top plate. Now, this bottom row is made up of a bunch of individual Kaizen foam holders. My thought here is that it's a quick way to organize a bunch of oddly shaped things, plus it's modular, so I can take the whole thing with me if I need to. We'll see if I ever use it for that. And I am gonna hold off cutting the tool pockets into those foam pieces for now. I've kept careful track of all my time, which will tally up at the end. 
And yes, I can just keep going making many more organizers. It's actually kind of addicting. But for the sake of science, let's head back to my garage shop so I can attempt to remake all of these by hand. I'll spare you most of this process, but I did want to mention a couple things. First off, I'm leaning on the scale a bit in favor of the traditional approach because I've already built these hangers, and though the three models don't help me much in here, they do at least give me a clear mental picture of what I'm making. I don't know about you, but I usually spend a lot of time at the beginning of this process just building the damn thing in my head first. The next thing to mention is that my shop is pretty simple. My walls aren't lined with Festool sustainers, and I have a very typical setup of what I imagine most people have at their disposal. For that reason, all things being equal, this should be a pretty good baseline. And finally, a couple of observations worth calling out. The first one is holes. You see, when you design something in a computer for digital fabrication, you could pretty much make any damn hole size you want, wherever you want. But when you build that thing in real life and realize that a single part has seven different obscure hole sizes, it really throws a wrench in the workflow. I was frankly a little shocked at how much time I ate up just changing bit sizes to match my design. The second observation is around repeated operations. We as humans are generally not great at making precise repeat movements. Our evolved brains have learned to make jigs or set up templates to help us out. But that does take time to do. And when you're doing a relatively small number of repetitive tasks, most of us, myself included, revert to our caveman brains and would rather seek instant gratification. So we skip that. Robots, on the other hand, are really, really good at repetitive work and don't need pesky jigs or templates to do it. And finally, assembly of the holders is pretty straightforward and was the quickest part of the job by far. Now let's get all these back to the tool wall and see how we did. So I was secretly hoping that these would look terrible, but they don't. I mean, up close, if you compare the digitally fabricated one to these, yeah, it's definitely uglier, but I mean, once they're up on the wall, they accomplish the exact same thing. And you also may notice that I got around to cutting the Kaizen foam inserts, which talk about a satisfying process. I've done this a couple different times around my shop and in various toolboxes, and every time it's just awesome. It's pretty cheap, it's easy to do, and I recommend you try it. And I know what you're thinking. You're looking at this and you say, yeah, but I don't have all these fancy digital fabrication tools, nor do I wanna take the time to learn them, and I certainly don't wanna build that myself. Well, the good news is that there's lots of small businesses out there, like A Glimpse Inside, run by my buddy Chris, who do it for you. He's got a bunch of really cool French clay organizers like this that he sells. I grabbed a couple of the drill holders and the sandpaper organizer. And what's really cool about something like this is Chris did all the design for you, everything snaps together and doesn't even need glue. I highly recommend you go check them out. It's a great opportunity to support a small business run by a really great guy. So the whole reason we did this was to figure out which method wins in this example. Man versus machine, fingers versus stepper motors, AI versus I. Well, functionally, they're identical. Aesthetically, I'd give a slight nod to the digital fabrication versions, but it's the slightest of nods. How about total time, though? I was just as curious as you probably are, so here's the results. For the digital fabrication method, I spent three hours at the computer doing the design work, and then an additional 30-ish minutes setting up the machines to start. And since I needed to tend to the laser cutter while it worked, that ate up another hour of my time, followed by 45 minutes for assembly of all of the holders. That brings the final time to five hours and 15 minutes. For the traditional tools method, I started by breaking down materials and laying out all of the designs. This took me one hour and 30 minutes, which was mostly just trying to figure out the layouts. Next was two hours, 15 minutes of cutting everything out, drilling holes, refining shapes, and just getting all the final designs done. And then assembly was relatively quick at 45 minutes. The total time for this method was four hours and 30 minutes. But wait. After any project, my shop was left in a state of chaos covered in sawdust. So I took an additional 30 minutes to clean up the space, make sure everything was put away, so I left it in the same condition I found it in. You don't really have to do that same thing with a 3D printer and a laser cutter, so I thought it was fair to include that in the comparison. But that time added, the traditional approach is now at five hours, which is eerily close to the five hours and 15 minutes of the digital fabrication approach. And to be honest, I was a little surprised by this result. I really thought it would be 2x the time to use digital fabrication for a one-off project like this. And I'm sure there's keyboard warriors out there right now rolling up their sleeves, getting ready to leave some comments. Pfft, I could have built those things in like 34 minutes with a circular saw and a speed square. Okay, maybe don't leave comments like that, but I am curious to know what you think. Did you see this coming or are you surprised like I am? Now, normally I'd make the case that digital fabrication is great for leverage and repeatability. So if you're producing a thing, digital fabrication makes all the sense in the world. I think in very specific examples like the shop organization project, which has a high level of complexity and bespoke parts, 
a digital fabrication tool might be actually a pretty good bet. Look, obviously with any examples, there's caveats and nuance and exceptions and all kinds of stuff. This was just one example I thought would be a fun experiment to show what was faster. See ya.